TED Talks that we've gone through uh, so far today. This is uh, the last one of the day, and so we picked a totally uncontroversial uh, <laughs> one. Uh, so, um, as with all these, like I said, we want them to be conversation starters. So we put this last, we'll talk about it afterwards. Uh, what I'm going to do is really quickly try to uh, summarize what our church's position is on gender roles, and uh, which is called uh, complementarianism. So complementarianism um, is not a movement to start complementing each other more. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, that's complement with an I. This is complement with an E, uh, which means to complete, to, uh, to, uh, to complement. So we have complementary collars, you know, like, you know, that collar on that wall really, really complements the wall collar. Or we have, uh, you know, that your, your blouse really complements your, your skirt or something like that, right? They go, they go together and they fill each other out and it makes something more beautiful. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about complementarianism. Uh, complementarian refers to this concept uh, applied to gender. It says that men and women are completely and totally equal in, in inherent worth, value, and dignity, yet they're not the exact same. They're not interchangeable. They are distinct in roles, and these different roles work together to make something beautiful. So male and female don't compete against each other, they dance together. And uh, I think you all agree, that's prettier than that. <laughs> Genesis uh, 127 says that God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. So there we see complete equality, both in the image of God, uh, right? But then Genesis 2 paints the same picture with a deeper texture, and it tells us that Adam was created first, and then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone, I'll make a helper suitable for him. And that Hebrew word uh, literally is uh, translated... Um, according to his opposite. So this scene is, is literally and poetically describing Adam and Eve as complementary counterparts in God's original very good design. This is beautiful. This is how it's supposed to work. Uh, Genesis 3 is where it all goes wrong. Uh, sin comes in, messes it up, disharmony enters. You've got all sorts of distortions that come in. Uh, our church uh, manifesto uh, that kind of lays out who we are as a church um, <coughs> states this. It says, the introduction of sin into the world caused male-female relations to be messed up. They either tend towards one extreme where men oppress women and or women act like doormats, or the other extreme where men are weak and or women attempt to usurp male authority. We must uh, seek to avoid both and all of those distortions. Uh, so the complementarian uh, position has two main applications. It has an application first to the home, and then to the church. So, uh, to the home. Look at that really fast. In the home, the Bible says that husbands and wives are supposed to relate together as a picture of Christ and his bride, the church. So the man is to be the head, uh, which means physically and spiritually providing, protecting, caring for, and sacrificially taking responsibility for the home. The woman is to joyfully and confidently submit to her husband and respect him, hopefully as a conscious desire to reflect the gospel. And that is explicit in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, Colossians chapter 3 and 1 Peter chapter 3. And if I had more time, we could find this all over other places in the Bible. So that's in the home. Then in the church, you've got to understand the church is the family of God. So it's basically the home writ large. Uh, and expanded. So Paul was concerned that Timothy know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God. So just like in the home, in the, the household of God, the church, it, it works the same way. In the church, there are leaders who are responsible for its provision, protection, and care, and they're called elders, and they are to be men who meet the qualifications spelled out in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus Two. Now, the main opposing viewpoint to complementarianism is called egalitarianism, um, and that's a position that maintains that there's no differentiation beyond physiological between males and females. That is, there's nothing in any way that would restrict someone 
uh, in any way solely based on his or her chromosomes from fully actualizing his or her potential. So for egalitarians, uh, roles are purely based on gifts, never limited by gender. That's what the deserve equal rights and opportunities. So you can see that this can be a contentious issue. So shouldn't we just leave it alone? Why does it matter? Uh, here's briefly five reasons. Uh, number one, you can't not have a position on this. Even if you said we're just not going to touch that, you, it just it, it can't work that way. Complementarianism matters because you can't not have a position. To take no position is essentially to default to the egalitarian position. So if we decide, decide as a church we're not going to take any position, a woman comes along and felt called and gifted towards uh, to be an elder, uh, we couldn't say no because we didn't have a position. So we'd have to say yes, and then we'd have women elders, and then we'd be a functioning egalitarian church because we'd have taken a position, right? Uh, so we have to take a position. Number two, I'll just be very brief here, and I say this so that we are not self-righteous or angry at our culture, that we're loving, we have to be loving, but gender is a hot-button issue in our culture today, and we need to know what the Bible says about it. Um, I'll leave that at that. Number three, uh, complementarianism matters because the Bible does teach on it in many, 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 many different places. Uh, for example, 1 Timothy 2.12 says unequivocally, uh, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. And then it says, for, here's my reason, here's what I'm going to ground this in. Adam was formed first and then Eve. So it, it, rest it restricts women uh, from a certain activity and then it grounds it in a pre-fall creation ordinance. This is how God made things to be. It's hard to get around. So we may have debates within the framework of complementarianism on how to apply this verse, but there really, there really is no responsible way around the fact that this verse teaches that men and women have different roles and it's not merely cultural. It's rooted in the very nature of how God created things. Number four, um, complementarianism matters because what's at stake is nothing less than the nature of biblical authority. To uh, adopt a way of reading these texts that eliminates all role differentiations based on gender is to pra in practice deny that Scripture is our only clear, final, sufficient revelation from God for our faith and practice. I've read all the books, not all the books, but I've read lots of books on this. I've seen the different arguments, and, and really, uh, this really is a big issue at this, this level. Um, it would not be letting the closed canon of Scripture itself, the Bible as it stands, uh, determine what's true and submit to it, but rather it would be to stand above the Bible based on our own modern cultural sensibilities and ideas of justice. So. Number four, five, uh, finally, complementarianism matters because it involves first-level doctrinal issues like the Trinity and the Gospel. I'm not saying it is a first-level issue. I'm saying that it gets really close and it touches on first-level issues. The Trinity uh, shows us that you can indeed have differentiation of roles and even submission within equality. The Gospel reminds us that our identity is never based upon what you can do or achieve, but about being in Christ. So, this is less than 18 minutes. I'm going to cede the rest of my time to uh, um, Sarah. She's going to uh, come up and uh, just share a little bit from her perspective as a woman, uh, who's just completed our pilot program of a women's theology uh, program. We had, for the last six months, five different women from the church, uh, in this uh, intensive uh, cohort uh, studying different things of theology, including this topic. And um, it was a blast. It was a really fun time, me and the gals. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so these, these, uh, several of these women testify to being the greatest experience in church they've had in their life. To me, that was pretty cool. So uh, we're going to continue doing that, look for more uh, information about what that's going to look like in the fall, and we're going to keep doing that because we, we love women, we, we want to empower and support and encourage women in, in all the ways that God wants us to. So, 
Um, that's, uh, that's an exciting thing. So anyway, Sarah, come up and share your perspective. So, kind of a big topic, huh? Just a little one. So, in 1963, Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan was published, uh, which would end up shaping the culture of America in 2014. Surely there have been other feminists who are outspoken and vocal, so why would Friedan hold so much sway? Good question, huh? Friedan pinpointed the question that was on the mind of women and offered an opportunity for them to ask with boldness. What was the question? Ferdinand says, the problem, problem lay buried unspoken for many years in the minds of American women. It was a strange stirring, a sense of dissatisfaction, a yearning that women suffered in the middle of the 20th century in the United States. Each, each suburban wife struggled with it alone as she made the beds, shopped for groceries, matched slipcover material, ate peanut butter sandwiches with her children, Show her Cub Scouts and brownies, lay beside her husband at night. She was afraid to ask even of herself the silent question, is this all? Is this all? Again, great question, <laughs> right? Great, great question. <laughs> so this woman, this book, and, and really that question are thought to be what really uh, pushed forward second wave feminism in our culture which has really permeated every aspect of the culture. We've been seeing that a lot in the cohort, that it really has affected all different types of thinking. The, rel the relevance of this in relation to how we think about biblical gender roles is crucial because we must be understanding of our own cultural context. As Nathan pointed out, this is undoubtedly a hot topic right now and one that Christians should be seeking uh, to face head on and not dodge or avoid, even though it's uncomfortable and a lot of you probably feel uncomfortable right now. <laughs> um, but yes, I wanted, I wanted to share a little bit of, of how I saw this. Um, so I saw evidences of this um, in the church I grew up in. My church was bent on seeking the lost and restoring those who had been hurt by other Christians by being a new type of religionless Christianity. It sounded really great. Um, really wanted to go out there and love those who had been hurt before. And this church called for a loving a level playing field, and the motto was everyone gets to play. One of the ways they implemented that idea was to set aside any distinctions in marriage and church between men and women. The answer to past oppression was more opportunity. To answer past oppression, it was more present future opportunity. As a young church began to grow to thousands and thousands, it really blew up, women continued to step up, whether that was to become a functioning elder or a lead teaching pastor. Both sexes were implored to believe that they were without distinction in church and marriage. And I'm saying this to show that I have lived and experienced a church where women, women's liberation was a cornerstone of the foundation. I haven't lived in a conservative Christian bubble my entire life that's just been complementarian. I've had no um, experience with anything else. In fact, I felt the pull to want to be the leader. I felt the pull to want to be the, the preacher and to be remembered as that memorable person. In fact, my mentor since eighth grade at that church became an associate pastor, then a senior pastor, and then a lead church planning pastor. And then many of my friends in that same group eventually also became pastors. So it was ingrained in me and in every girl there that this is what you do. This is for you. Um, so I felt it. I, I don't want it to seem as though like I've, I've not felt that. I felt that drive. So, as I said, I saw many girls do this, but as I saw the church develop, I became less and less convinced that this was true freedom and that it was actually good or beneficial for the men or for the women. So, to explain, over the course of 30 plus years, the majority of people in leadership of that church were women. There was a steady dwindling of willing leaders that were male, and men were typically not sought out as women were were for these positions. They just, the guys decided, hey, they're going to take care of it. I don't feel that gifted. I don't like my free time. So you girls do the heavy lifting. We'll kick back. You can take care of it. And the girls responded with a, yeah, just leave it to us. And slowly, 
it became very well known that the women ruled and the men followed. It's kind of a strange so. As I said before, this wasn't just in the church, but in marriages as well. Women were the decisive decision makers and men were the passive followers. What was funny was that the church had labored to build and strengthen these women to the neglect of the men, but the men didn't feel equipped to date these women. So it's kind of, again, it's kind of strange. Men sighed with discontentment and women shrugged with loneliness. Seemingly, the response to a culture of feminism by ridding of all gender distinctions wasn't working. Even in a, a, a Christian church, it wasn't working. A lack, of a lack of opportunity was not the actual problem. So, the question is, what happened? <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> um, so I guess to kind of preface it, those who know me, Bethany, Vivian, or Abby, especially probably Peter. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not necessarily the type of person woman to sit idly by and find any form of submission to be super easy. <laughs> um, I've had, like I said, the pull to teach a congregation. I've had the drive to want to make more and bigger decisions in my marriage. And I think growing up with three brothers, I learned that I wanted to compete with guys and that I could. And that was fun. Um, so I also found that feminism raised some really great questions, right? I mean, no one's denying they're good questions. Is house woofery the ultimate goal? Are men better than women? But I think more importantly, will we first trust scripture over our own cultural context? Again, as Nathan said, biblical authority and important doctrine are at stake over this. And Christians should not shy away from these questions, but should seek to answer them. So to, re to reiterate, what happened to me? I began to look to scripture to define womanhood instead of just society. Undeniably, the idea of biblical gender roles is completely countercultural. <clears throat> As a Christian, there are times when I honestly hesitate to speak about these topics uh, because it does cause secular thinking to boil over in disbelief. You believe what? And that can be pretty uncomfortable. I mean, I'm sure you guys, again, feel kind of uncomfortable. So I do hesitate to talk about it. Sometimes, but I think I've seen a couple things in reading scripture and in, in having these conversations. I've learned a couple things. First, I see my own leanings and proclivities. As I just mentioned, I am not by nature a woman with a gentle spirit. God's word exposes my sin and reveals that I am pursuing what feels good and what comes easy. By nature, I am prone to do which comes easiest, and for me, that is to seize control and to seek power. And seeing that my longings bend this way, I can more rightly see my own selfish motives. Because, because of all this, the feminist advertising markets itself to people just like me, to women just like me. Their answers sound very good to my questions. So with all that said, I'm very susceptible to the lures of uh, second faith feminism. The second thing I've learned, and more importantly, God gives us grace to live and love his good design. <clears throat> Clearly, I am incapable on my own to cherish these doctrines unless Christ does a work in me to trust him as Lord. Because God is a good God, I can lean all my weight on the hope that his intentions are not only for his glory, but simultaneously also for my good. Complementarianism is beautiful. God has arranged men and women to have particular giftings and roles for human flourishing. And actually, after going to that church for about seven years, I started attending a church that practiced complementarianism. They stood in stark contrast to one another. It wasn't IBC, it was actually a church in Champaign. Just a second. <laughs> um, they stood in, st in stark contrast to one another. The second one had ingrained in the congregation that this doctrine of complementarianism, as Nathan said, isn't a matter of... Uh, competency or equality, but how the Lord intends his people to live godly, growing lives. In practicing complementarianism, both sexes felt valued and utilized in this church. None of them felt as though they were being um, snubbed or uh, forgotten about. And that's how it should be. True complementarianism uh, appreciates both sexes. And sometimes I think that we get hung up on words like submission and headship, uh, because they kind of give you the heebie-jeebies. 
Um, but I think you forget also that God used these words, and he did so for a good purpose. Sometimes I think we also neglect the fact that it takes a strong, thoughtful, Bible-believing woman to submit to her fallible husband. Wives. Amen. 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 It takes a strong woman. Because when she does this, she's going against her own flesh and trusting the Lord, right? This doctrine is beautiful in how it sanctifies and confronts sin. I've grown to see this doctrine is beautiful. Keep in mind, I didn't say easy or comfortable, but it is excellent because it was the Lord's design. So, in 1963, Ferdinand asked, is this all? And as Christians, we say, no, this is not all, but Christ is. And that allows us to find hope and joy in daily, mundane, or in entirely countercultural actions. Because Christ is my all, I can take him at his word. Because Christ is my all, I see complementarianism to be 